It's getting closer. It's getting closer. What's KL Rahul doing in a strip club? It wasn't a strip club, but it kind of looked like it. On the show today, we speak to Alex Malcolm from ESPN Crick Info, a real hardcore, not so much X's and O's chat, but more about what this Ashes series means for you, what it means for me, what it means for Zach Crawley. Meg Lanning is out of the ashes. Elisa Healy will lead Australia for the women's ashes. Joss Wall's in for Guy Quad as a standby play for the World Test Championship. The IPL final was rained off for one day, so we need to just give it a breath. Just give it a breath. Just give it a breath. That's not what you said. Just give it a breath for one day. And then we can find out if MS Dhoni will end cricket. Also, Sabah, 34 ball 100. That's before we get into hashtag AskTGC, where we get a review from Wisdom and more specifically from Josh. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler. Head to budgiesmuggler.com. If you're sitting at your desk right now, you know what? If you're sitting anywhere in the world right now, go to budgiesmuggler.com and brighten your day with hats, shirts, T-shirts, bucket hats, budgies, designer budgies, whatever you want. That's budgiesmuggler.com. Do you? Sam Perry, it was great to have Alex on the show. He's just left the studio beforehand, and uh, that was a nice chat we had with Alex. It was sort of forty odd minutes there, and that's what the main, uh, the main crux of this episode is going to be. As it's uh, well, generally speaking, been a slow news day, news week for the cricket cycle, the cricket news cycle. And why would it be? Because the Ashes is like three weeks away, and the World Test Championship is like a week and a half. So why would anyone be talking about the cricket? Okay. Uh I thought you did very well to fill that introduction. That's with, all we've got time for today, with mate. The idea that lots is happening in cricket. Thanks. Like, I'm, I'll, I'll just level. I'll just level with you. Not a lot doing. Mm-hmm. Not a lot doing. If you've clicked on this link to 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 listen to this episode, good luck to no, you. No, we went we went <laughs> we went long with Alex. It was nice. It was a nice cricket chat. Forty minutes of analysis from yeah. a smart guy who follows the game like a journalist and knows what the fuck's going on and can catch. Yeah, and can catch yeah. indeed. And boy, can he catch. <clears throat> Yep, and what a catch he is for his wife. <laughs> now, <laughs> really, like, yeah, we, sh- we should say to those who are listening to this now, if, you- if you're tuning in for IPL final analysis, you're not going to get it because we're recording uh, a couple of hours before the final takes place. The final was postponed by a day because of wild storms and shit in Amdabad. Absolutely so, pissed it down. And I think it's funny, like there's, uh, there seems to be a connection between the fact not a lot's going on in cricket mm-hmm. and the IPL final was going to be on. I'm just not sure if it's like, if we, I'm not sure if there's meant to be a connection there. Don't, or I, can't like, say I, I don't know if cricket's been cleared for it. I'm, I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. But mate, I, I agree, like we're a couple of weeks away from the Ashes now uh, and succession finale's on tonight. That's you know? huge. That's, That's huge. fucking good. If true. Yeah, if true. Uh, and you know, you, you got a birthday coming up. I mean, we That's have, li- we have lives, true. we have lives outside yeah, of this yeah. stuff. Like, yeah. uh, it's my anniversary with my wife, you know, Huge. today, if true. uh, and you know, <laughs> it, and it is true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. And you know, there's, there's not a lot of other cricket. I'm like, we're looking at, I'm looking at this list. We're, we're, what are we leaning into? Jicewell re- replaces Guyquart as a standby player. Guyquart's getting married. He's not even playing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. Who gives a shit? So I just. Playing the IPL. Yeah, yeah, good yeah, player. Yeah, yeah. Good, easy, he'll, he'll, uh, really, mate, he'll score yeah. thousands. Yeah. But uh, all all formats, pure. You know, Moody said it. But really, like, I, I don't want to fill shit. You know, I don't just want to fill idle talk. You don't want to. You don't want to lie to the viewers and listeners. Yeah, don't lie to them. I'm just saying what's what's real about life. You know what I mean? I'm going to try and get a. You know, I'm looking forward to our live show in Sydney tomorrow night. By the way, uh, for those who have been texting and saying, can I get them a spare ticket? And I don't know who they are. Uh, we have a small handful of tickets that are going back on sale now because uh, to, to just so you don't think that we're like lying about it being sold out and shit, uh, we get a couple of complimentary tickets and our mates aren't fucking interested. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going to see us. Yeah. Uh, see you yeah. on stage. Yeah. Why? So there's a, couple, there's a, there's a, there's a handful of tickets uh, yeah. on sale if you, if you want them. Um, yeah, we, you know, we've got an IPL final tomorrow night. Talk to Alex. We've got a live show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. I don't know. That's about it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, top top uh, headline here is Hazelwood in the Australia World Test Championship. I mean, this Squalled. is what we're talking about. Squalled. The, 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 the main news in cricket today mm-hmm. is Australia trims its squad from 17 to 15. Oh. Oh. Fucking stop the presses. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I saw a Fox Sports headline saying, blo- no blow, blow for Marsh. You yeah. know? I mean, he's, he's, he's got a couple of days off. Beauty. He wasn't going to play. 18 holes. You know? Yeah, 18 holes. Stable for, stable for points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else we got? You know, um, 
But does it, I mean, Hazelwood's in. We, we, talk, we talked to Alex about Hazelwood and, and injuries and shit. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, he, he feels like he's stuck together by sticky tape. Hopefully, he's, you know, the bush horse is good to go. What yeah. else is there to say? What else is there to say is that at this point, you should basically fast forward to the Alex chat because it was really good. Oh, we, that- can, we can do some <laughs> shit, you know. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think, I think you know, like, mm. but let's not pretend that there's a fuckload going on in cricket. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. That we want to talk about, right? Okay. Uh, Pearson's in the Ashes squad halfway through. Mm-hmm. Is he, he's going to come in. Inglis is he's off to get married. That's nice. It's nice for Jimmy. He's, he's an injury away from a ton at Headingley. That'll be a good story. Good stuff. He's been a good player. <laughs> the tone of this podcast <laughs> is very confusing. That's good. That's cricket. This is authenticity. Jimmy Pearson, I've said to you before, I feel like he's unlucky to be behind Josh Inglis. Or, or Joss Inglis, I like to call him sometimes, uh, in the Red Ball squad. I mean, Joss Inglis is uh, he's, he's English, so you know that that's, that that's got to be a factor, right? Joss English, <laughs> jo- Joss English, that's got to be a factor. <laughs> The boys I, are thought, on today. I, mean, I mean, the Sheffield Shield season, Jimmy Pearson was outstanding. Uh, multiple hundreds, good gloves, neat gloves, um, you know, into the squad. But uh, I suppose he just got the first few Test matches, and then uh, I do like I do like the uh, the genre of. Um, like reserve keepers who go to Ashes, you know, they go for a tour. Graham Manu, my favourite. Yeah, Wade Second. I reckon he got one. Fuck, uh, Wade Second must have been good. Yeah. To never play. He ever play? No, he never played. No, nah, I don't think he got a game. No, Graham Manu got, got a game. game. Mm-hmm. He got a game. He got multiple games. Did he? First yeah. in a test cricket? Yeah, yeah, Manu? yeah. yeah. I yep. thought he filled in for one. Okay. Oh, I th- couple? Oh, I think it was, I think it was a couple. Oh, you're, of giving ba- him, you're giving him a couple of pack the, of greens? The back end of the 2009 yeah. season, I okay. think, when Payne broke his finger. Right. Tests. Tests. Payne wasn't playing tests in 09, was he? I think Payne might have been the, oh, let's, let's look it up. Let's look it up. I thought Manu got a game at the Ashes. Yeah, 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 he did. Yeah. But I think he played more than one. Graham Manu. Here we go. He, yep, just wait for it. He played one test match. He okay. played one test he match. Did, he had a few dreams. That's all right. Yeah. That's okay he for you. He played four ODIs, Graham Manu. I, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. okay. Oh, is that what you're thinking? Hadden broke his finger right. in 2009. Easy, and then, easy mistake to make. And then a few months later, it was flown in this emergency replacement for Tim Payne during the ODI series, same summer. ODI. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's what I'm thinking That's about. That's all right. Anyway. When you're playing grade cricket, no one really knew what was going on. Graham, no, he played 25 stuff. tests, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, he gave me a couple of tests there, boy. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's, I think that's a good genre. Phil Emery as well. He got a couple. Got yeah. a couple of tests. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of good keepers behind Healy at the time as well. I suppose so. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, an important one, he goes, uh, is and and more, uh, you know, so, somber and solemn is uh, Meg Lanning is out of the ashes, uh, and she's been ruled out due to medical reasons, uh, and nothing further being said about that at the moment. Tightly kept, um, Alyssa Healy will lead the side uh, in the multi-format series. Uh, so, uh, all you can say really is that, you know, I and we hope she's okay and all the best. Indeed. Um, England are playing Ireland in their warm-up game because, again, it's an actual test match, but it is just a warm-up game. Uh, Australia playing against India in their warm-up game, but uh, England playing Ireland. Uh, lots to get, lo- lots to look forward to there. I mean, what Josh kind Tung of- came in. Oh, yeah, well, he got Steve Smith out once, therefore it'll Did happen it? forever. Okay. Tungy. Yeah. Don't know. You know, Alan what, Tung. What is it? Is it pace? Like, your thing is with, with Quicks, is, like, is, it, is it wheels he's bringing? Is it swing? Is it skiddy stuff? What's mm-hmm. the style? You know, choose your fighter. I don't know. It's a name to me at the moment. And I wonder if he's related to Alan Tung. Of That's course. it. I'm yes. Australian. Yes, the Canberra halfback from 2005. Mm-hmm. Playoff back. Um, so uh, I think um, I think for, the, for, the, for this series, they just want absolute bulk runs. They just want someone to score 400, and they want Jimmy Anderson, if he plays, to take 14 wickets. Mm-hmm. And then they'll be like, well, one nil England. 14 wickets will leave him one short of 700. That's, that's, that is going to be tough, isn't it? It's tough for a lot of us of, of certain persuasions. That, I mean, that, we haven't really spoken about how much that's going to hurt when Jimmy Anderson goes past Shane Warne, potentially in these Ashes series. I mean, that's, that's a good that's, series that's, for him. That's going to be a good yeah. series. Well, 708, it was yeah. Warne, right? Yeah. Okay, so what's, what's he on? 685. 685. Yeah. 23 wickets. Well, Broad took, 20, Broad took 23 wickets last, uh-huh. last time around in 2019. Uh, Cummins took 29. Mm-hmm. So it is, I mean, it is possible. It's in the ballpark. Mm. He's a fit guy. He can play all the test matches. Mm. It's a, mm. uh, but if he did it, what if he did it at the Oval? Mm. 
What if you did it anywhere? That's going oh, to be hard to take. Emotionally so saying, hard to take. 709 wickets. So 20, 24. He goes 709. Mm-hmm. The Oval. Mm-hmm. England wins. Mm-hmm. He's chaired off into the sunset. Mm-hmm. Fucking David Warner's retirement's in his pocket. Yep. You know, that's the wet dream. So does Ben Stokes really want 59-metre boundaries and flat hard ones? You know what I'm saying? Jack Leach doesn't, I would suspect. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, that's a distinct possibility. I think Jimmy Anderson's their best player, and I'm afraid of him. You're, you're saying like you're saying right off into the sunset, like like you won't play forever. I was gonna, like the, like the sun's going to be out uh, <laughs> in <laughs> June. Know, that, I wouldn't have thought that, so. That, Sam. that dappled light in London. Head off to a, a little a little pub south. There's, 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 there's no streaming there's, onto the str- spilling onto the streets. There's no with a pint. Sh- there's no chat about uh, him retiring into the, the series, though. Is there? No, no. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so it's just a fantasy. If you want to talk about the World Test Championship final, which is in uh, what about a week and a half or so, uh, Rudraj Gaikwad is uh, out of the. He's out of the squad. Uh, he's out of the standby squad. He's out of the standby squad, and they got Jai Wall. And Jai Wall's amazing story. How old's Jai? Was he twenty one? Is he, he's a young fella. Is he, I don't know even that old. Yeah, um, he has just absolutely dominated the IPL this year, opening the batting for Rajasthan. He's hit two hundreds, rapid hundreds, opening the batting there with Joss Butler, who didn't have his best ever season. It must be said, um, but he has come in to replace Guy Quad. Uh, it's just an amazing story, and uh, I'm not sure what it is. I actually I do know about his red ball form for the for the Ranji Trophy. He is the equal fastest ever to one thousand runs in the Ranji Trophy. He did in thirteen yeah. innings. That's one thing I know about Joss Wall. Um, the so IPL, he can play. The guy can play. I, the IPL generally, uh, as Pez said earlier, that the IPL final was washed out there and in uh, Ahmedabad. And um, the story of the last week or so, I think the last time we spoke, Cameron Green had already scored 100 off 43 balls or something. I think that had already happened. Um, but since then, uh, the story has been Shubman Gill, who has hit 300s in four innings. I read somewhere on the internet that the only other person to ever score three T20-100s in four innings was Michael Klinger. He did it for in uh, one who he played for in the county in the county setup, <laughs> whenever that tournament was. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. What are you laughing at? No, like, like no, I, I was I was thrown by, um, you know, I was like, oh, who could it be who scored those oh, yeah, runs? Right, like, right, Michael, Michael Klinger. Klinger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mickey K, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess for Australians listening again who have been following the Ds, et cetera, uh, the, I guess the the charge on Gill is like he's the, he's the guy after Coley. You know, like Gil, Gil is the anointed one. A lot of people lining up for it, I think, like as in lining up to be that next one. And yeah, in, sure. In, so three tons in 15 days or something. Incredible. I thought, uh, Joy on Crick Buzz mm. made the point that, uh, that the Kolkata Knight Riders have scored two hundreds in the entirety of their IPL history. Right, wow. And uh, Shubman Gill has three in 15 days. And the last one was like, they get better and better. Uh, the last oh, one was God. 129 off 60. Yeah. He was upset out in the 16th over, like, you know, blowing up one of the great like, opportunities to blow up in cricket when you've actually done well just oh, to yeah. show that your standards are higher than what you've achieved, which is also good. Yeah. Uh, and so he understands how cricket works. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, a, a lot of, you know, and then so this final, uh, people are listening to it after it's taken place, but it's ultimately, um, you know, Dhoni versus Gill, really, you know, the outgoing man. Is it Don't is it Dhoni's last game? Is he going to win the game right off into the sunset again, like Anderson? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in a ball of yellow love, or you know, or is the new man coming to steal the throne? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, you know, that I, I guess that's good. That's what the matchup is: GT and CSK. GT obviously won it last year. Can they go back to back, or can CSK Dhoni? End cricket of all time. He's played in he's played in eleven finals. CSK have played in ten of fourteen seasons. They were not in the competition for two years because uh, a bit of the old uh, match fixing going on there uh, got banned for a couple of years. Uh, in in that year, in that year, Donny played for fuck. Who was it? Was it uh, was it Pune? Was that who he played for? He played for someone else, and he he made the final yeah, with that Super team. Giants. Yeah, in that year as well. Uh, amazing, amazing consistency from CSK and from MSD himself. So, uh, so that's the matchup. Interesting to see what happens tonight. Interesting times ahead, indeed. Hey, uh, Sean Abbott, Sabah, thirty-four ball hundred there for Surrey. Was that at the Oval? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah, flattest deck in the country. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but amazing stuff from Sean Abbott. Uh, I've seen some. I've seen some of the highlights. I'll be. I must confess, I wasn't catching every ball of the T of the uh, the T Twenty Blast. Or was it just called the Blast? Damn it, I don't know. Um, but uh, wonderful stroke play and. A great opportunity when someone scores th- that many runs that quickly. When you see, he starts his innings like you, oh, he was, he was two off two. So he's actually scored his last nine out runs off thirty two. Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. A slight yeah. That's right. That's uh, right. 
yeah, equaled Andrew Simons, I think, for that's uh, right, yeah, four ball hundred, right. And I think I read it was sixty nine runs more than his previous highest score. Wow! So uh, he's really he's really transcended himself with this innings, Sabba. And if you haven't seen it, it's a hell of a celebration. Yeah, it reminds it's good. me of the. Uh, of who I always assumed was Trevor Hendy in the Nutrigrain ad, <laughs> but they have a new voice now for the Nutrigrain ad, <laughs> like a sort of yeah, it's kind of like a like of a Velociraptor. It's much more demonic. Demonic. Dem- uh, yeah, that's right. This one. Yeah. The old, the old one was more child friendly, which is why you oh, said more Nutrigrain. Oh, are you comparing the old and new Nutrigrain ad? Yeah. Uh, voice sounds. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the old one was friendly. The new one is demonic. Yep. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I think about old ads now, I think about the old Amy ad and the new one. They just never got it right. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with cricket, unless the woman liked the game. <laughs> let us know if you're that woman. Write in. Jump in the emails. Let us know if you're that specific woman in the Amy ads from the early 2000s. But great tons ever. <laughs> it was a great celebration. It was arms a lot. As you would. It, it, it's like... He'll have no regrets about whether he, like, enjoyed that moment. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It wasn't, mm-hmm. like, relief more than anything or I was in shock. He fucking, he it was into it. Yeah. It was good gear. Uh, you're telling me the World Cup schedule is being announced during the World Test Championship final? Yeah. Cricket's uh, ending everywhere. This could be the last Test match. Could be the last 50 over World Cup. Uh, it occurs to me that irritated members of, uh, like, like people for whom this matters, I suppose. Like, it, it's, I guess uh, India has a... Uh, tendency or the BCCI has a tendency to announce its schedule for games far sooner to their commi- to their commencement or announcing them late would be a better way of saying it uh, than, right. than normal. You know, like this is a World Cup year. People normally know where the fuck games are yeah. and, and what they've got to do to get to games or get accommodation or all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it has now emerged that during the World Test Championship, the BCCI will release the schedule for the World Cup. Uh, and it's like, mm, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, well, they're probably trying to figure out the Asia Cup, which is being held in Pakistan, but yeah, India, sh- India have not. India have denied the, uh, the the privilege of going to Pakistan to play their game. So I think what they're trying to do is it was going to be uh, posited to whoever was on, on the board to make that decision that the game. I think there's like it's an eight game tournament, and three were going to be in Pakistan, and the other five were going to be in the, either the UAE or Sri Lanka. That's uh, what pa- pa- that was Pakistan's compromise position. Yes, yes, that's right. And there wasn't expected to be much blowback from that uh, from that offer. Yeah, but I didn't see. I didn't actually see what happened. This was three or four days ago. Right. Probably should have brought that to the agenda. But uh, but hey, here we are. Hey, uh, the India squad are in in the UK already. Are uh, the ones that aren't in the um, IPL final tonight. Uh, Coley's already there, and mu- and very much so is Kale Rahul, mm-hmm. um, who it was. Uh, I don't know who actually whose Twitter video it was. It was an Instagram story actually uh, that um, they were filmed in the like in a in a private club, and there were there was there were dozens of these private clubs specifically in London where there's like there's like tabletop dancers with scantily clad women, mm. um, Lon- lingerie clad women. That's what I'm looking at now, or a woman on a table, <laughs> and and yeah. someone who appears like K L Rahul. It does look like a K L Rahul is sitting there, and. Uh, and it's caused a bunch of uh, <clears throat> responses, I think, and people essentially saying, you know, get the context right or whatever. I'm kind of like, personally, I'm like, play on, you know, like that would be perfect in baseball. You know what I mean? For like me, that, I'm that's, like, that's literally like the England team has a has a twenty percent discount to these clubs. You know what I mean? Because that, that's what McCullum wants them to do to yeah. chill, you know, and do it how they want. Oh yeah, what's let, the issue? Let the boy watch. <laughs> <laughs> Is what is what the I way see. my father <laughs> let me watch <laughs> the way his father <laughs> exactly exactly uh, okay well let's talk to Alex Malcolm for the actual serious part of this show which was uh, which was highly enjoyable very very great very great it was not, very not, great not just great it was actually very great <laughs> you know what I'll do one of them it was fucking very great to talk to Alex Malcolm for forty odd minutes. Uh, and this is, of course, thanks to Budgie Smuggler, who are back on board with TJC during these here Ashes, the final ever Ashes, the dying embers of a once glittering tournament, the Ashes, brought to you by Budgie Smuggler, budgiesmuggler.com.au. Here he is. Here is the great man, Alex Malcolm. 
Very lucky to once again have Alex Malcolm, Associate Editor, ESPN, Crick Info, pretty much wander up from his house. Uh, and it's your first day back, isn't it, Alex, after a little bit of paternity leave? Were uh, you the guy that tried to break in with a crowbar? <laughs> 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 no, that's encased in glass. Uh, so you're looking at the Ashes and World Test Championship to a lesser extent, Alex, uh, you know, with a bit of a blank canvas, you know, being back at work now. Like, is there any uh, is there any storyline that particularly stands out to you or that you're particularly interested in when it comes to, let's say, the Aussie men uh, through the next six, seven weeks? Not really. I just think it – they're going to be six fascinating test matches. Uh, this, the first one is is really interesting off the back of what we saw in India, and I was lucky enough to be there like you guys, and I think Australia feel like they really let one slip there, uh, an opportunity to to beat India in India, and this is a completely different set of circumstances facing the same opposition in diametrically opposed conditions. And so they may even face a completely different style of 11 and style of cricket that India is going to play because... They may even leave out Ashwin. You never know out of that 11. So uh, that in itself will be really interesting. There's some intel coming back from England from um, the guys that have played over there already that the Oval is going to play pretty quick and bouncy, which is interesting in itself. Uh, And then the Ashes, I'm as fascinated as anyone to see how England are going to play and then how Australia will match A, the tempo, B, the style, and just... Who knows what's going to happen because England have been playing exhilarating cricket for 12 months. So, yeah, the the whole six-test tour, essentially, is a fascinating one for me. I'm very excited to take a look at it. Do you reckon, uh, like, we've been sort of talking about where the team can elevate themselves to? Like, if they, if they win the World Test Championship first and then they obviously win the Ashes, does that elevate them to, like, legendary status? Or are they already uh, – well, they're not already legends, are they? They're just good. They're a great side. I think it. I think it is a legacy piece for for the guys that have been there for let's say a ten year period. I mean, the core of the team's been together since around about the 2010, 2011, 2012 yeah. mark. If you think about all of those guys, Smith, Kawaja, and Warner as a batting group, all debuted within twelve months, eighteen months of each other, and then the big three quicks plus line were all into the team between 2011 and Hazelwood joined a little bit later in 2014, but he was in and around the mark at that point. So that core group of individuals plus the younger guys that have come into the squad, they, they've been together for quite a while and this would be a huge legacy piece for them to add a, a WTC title and then beat England in, in England, which uh, Australia hasn't done since 2001. They had the draw obviously in 2019. So, mm. yeah, it would be a, a, a fitting finish for a group that's probably going to start to dissipate over the next 12 to 18, 24 months, I guess, particularly, you know, with Warner and Kawaja in their mid to late 30s and mm-hmm. the bowlers, who knows how long they're going to go for. So, yeah, it, it's a, a great opportunity for them. They won't get a better chance to complete two um, very rare things in the one go. Mm. Mm. I feel like the biggest macro storyline is is baseball, Alex. Like, uh and that lack of predictability and the fact that Australians are asleep when England or any other team is playing, so we don't even trust that it exists. Uh, it's like this thing you sort of search on Google. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, and Australia, the, the, the men's team's, like, public posture to it has been, like, not not really dismissive, but more aloof. You know, I think early on it was like, oh, let's see how they do it against our boys. But, like, since then it's kind of like the – you know, pretty standard line of like, well, it's great what they're doing for cricket, etc. Okay, I'll ask a few questions about it. Let's see if they're still swinging up five for 50. Do you think that is a public line? Uh, because like the thing about baseball is that like it's this, like it's such an obvious strategic like philosophy, like, and it's in your face. You can't miss it. They zealously pursue it. So I wonder like whether the, the spotlight will be on Andrew McDonald, you know, like as in, do you think the Aussies will just be like, look, we're just going to play our game and forget how they're doing? Or do you think Andrew McDonald, who like strikes me as a guy up for an intellectual challenge in cricket, will have like 18,000 plans? Because for him, it's a great opportunity to show, obviously, that you know he can kill uh, an opposition strategy. They are very aware of what baseball's capable of, and they're definitely planning for it. It won't be 18,000 plans, but they'll have some things up their sleeve that they're looking at 
they they are definitely up for the challenge. The public line of we'll play our game and um, worry about us is is fair enough, but they they're well aware of what England's capable of, and I think not just the the scoring prowess on the batting side. They're very much aware that. England has taken 20 wickets in every test match mm. that Ben Stokes and Brendan McCullum have been in charge for. That's an incredible feat for any team anywhere in the world in the history of the game over a 12-month period. I don't know how many test matches that is exactly in that time. but So they're bowling. 11. Is, so like, like they, they've won 10 and lost one. The bowling mm. complements the batting so well. And it's not just the fact that they're scoring so fast that's giving the bowling time because they've done it bowling first you know Ben Stokes famously I don't know how many times last winter our winter English summer won the toss and said yeah we'll chase I mean that's that's absurd but that that's what they're doing so the Aussies are very well aware of that they'll be well planned they'll have their ideas I think in the back of their minds that there'll be a bit of bravado and ego internally thinking yeah if we if we crank our quicks up on on some quicker wickets and and just crank hit, it hit, up. <laughs> <laughs> hit the right areas. Uh, I feel like some old uh, coaching yeah. generations would have would have responded that way. Like, let's just crank it up. Yeah, you absolutely. Know what I mean? Let's um, have a look upstairs. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I, I think they'll be referencing you know what they're able to do against a very similar group of individuals in the 21-22 Ashes series on yeah. some different style of wickets, and but they were mentally in a different space than England. So you. you you just don't know. I, honestly, you don't know, and it's going to be fascinating to watch. What, who, the player they haven't seen is Harry Brook. Yeah. Uh, so he will be a, a challenge um, to come up against. Obviously, Besto comes back refreshed, uh, and he played well out here in Australia when he was here, and he's mm. a great player, and we know what Stokes and Root can do. Their top three is an interesting area. I'd be, I'd be curious mm. to see if Duckett can have the success that he's had away mm. from home. Mm. Um, Crawley's obviously a big question mark, uh, and Pope's... Yeah, he's been hot and cold at various times. So, yeah, it's going to be a fascinating uh, watch in terms of how Australia will implement their plans and whether they'll be successful. You know, like, as, as you, you sort of answered the question there, but, like, just as a fan, I just, like, wrap myself in 90s Australiana because that's when we all grew up, right? And then that's when England barely fucking played. Um, I mean, they tried their best, but they were just terrible. So I'm just looking at, like, England's team and, like, given the our, our jobs, we watch heaps of cricket, right? And we've seen these guys – I can do amazing things, but like I'm just like, well, was that Crawley's going to get dropped? And then that changed their whole team. Ben Duckett, please, Ollie Pope, no, thank you. Joe Root never scored 100 against England <laughs> since 2015. Um, <laughs> Harry Brook, no, that's, that's a little bit too middle class for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ben Stokes, he's on one leg, he won't play. Um, Bearstow averages 35 in Test cricket or some shit, you know. And so, like in my head, it's like, oh well, now I'm Nathan Lyon, and Australia's won five nil, and yeah. we don't need to play the games. But like. So that that's my that's my Australian instinct coming out. Except what the team has done in the last what was it ten of eleven? It's pretty good. So I mean, that I think that makes it interesting. You know, it, but it's England's story. It's not really Australia's story, though. Australia are the team that are playing for greatness, aren't they? So I mean, it's it's that it, that that for me is like, well, this this series could be fucking anything, mm. and I feel like the sky could like MS Stoney's going to win it somehow. Obviously, mm. <laughs> but, I don't have a question there for you, but I think that's just my excitement for the series, but. I guess I will tack on a question. Um, Who is the alpha? <laughs> what, what's my name and where am I? <laughs> uh, okay. Zach Crawley gets dropped, right? <clears throat> what happens then? Are you, are you into the Stokes opening the batting thing? Are you no, into that? No way. Nah, it they doesn't would, sound right, does it? They couldn't possibly. Uh, he might want to do it. But they would, they would talk him off that ledge. Yeah, There's okay. no way Brendan McCullum is going to let him open the batting with his workload. They know he's going to have overs to bowl. They know he's got a lot of work to do in the field. He's been very proactive as a captain and has been a part of that, a key part of that bowling group being so successful in the way that he's manipulated fields, kept mm. the game moving, done mm. different things. Uh, if anyone watched any of what they did in Pakistan on those wickets... Mm. Stokes's vision and left field thinking was a huge part of why they took sixty wickets. Right, on right, right. The flattest things in the world. Yeah, I mean they took twenty wickets in Royal Pindi, where Australia bowled two hundred and thirty overs and took four mm. earlier in that that same year. So they, they they can't let him open the batting. It's too mm. too big a workload. 
And don't forget, he, he he's captain, so he will be targeted. He's going to get targeted. So <laughs> they're going to try and get him out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so so I, that's, there, that's a f- something he has to deal with. There's no way though. <laughs> there's no way he'll do that. And even when he became captain, he moved himself back down the order. Remember, he was up as high as was it three or four at one stage under Silverwood, and when Root, he did he did bat quite high okay. at one period. Yeah. And then as soon as he became captain, he's like, no, I've, I've got a bowling workload. I've got yeah. the captaincy workload. I'm going to bat six. This is where I'm going to bat, and mm-hmm. we're going to fit the rest of the order around that. So he, he may, may maybe for something really different, randomly first up, fresh in a series, he might walk out. I don't know, but I, I can't see how they would let it happen across the course of five test matches where he would have that workload. It just mm. seems impossible to me. And you wouldn't ask the wicketkeeper to do it either. So I think they'd have to find another solution. I don't know what it would be. I I like what you're doing there because the thing about Bazball is that no one knows what Bazball is. And so you're goading England into saying that they can't do something. So now they will need to put Stokes up top. I I want to introduce a dimension to this Ashes preview that came from an interview I just read with um, in The Guardian between Donald McRae and Mike Brearley, Mike Brearley being the great England captain, uh, come psychoanalyst. Mm-hmm. and uh, um, That's a weekend title. <laughs> <laughs> who, was, who was known very broadly for w- whatever he might have lacked in talent or skill he made up for in, you know, man management. Uh-huh. And uh, so, you know, a real leader of men. And he was speaking, uh, must have only been the last 24, 48 hours, about uh, how the whole zeal of England's cricket is led by the fact that both Brendan McCullum and Ben Stokes have overcome depression uh, and they're, they're playing cricket as, you know, kind of free people in mm-hmm. response to their own uh, travails in life. You know, for, for McCullum, it was about uh, New Zealand being bowled out for 45 and then going, you know, let's remember why we play the game, you know, to, to love it. And Ben Stokes obviously has his own stuff that is well detailed in that uh, documentary uh, about him. And so I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, I I feel like this series is so interesting because like it's such an unlikely match of like ego positions like England are like brash and out there and they're sledging mm. Mm. and they're in the press and Ollie Robinson saying we're going to give him a hiding and Australia is now like Cummins UNICEF jerry cans <laughs> McDonald <laughs> is a absent-minded professor and we're used to the Aussies being like you know slouch hats <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. Gallipoli like yeah. and how like how how does Australia's ego free humility like deal with you know England on the front foot? Mm. I just do not fucking understand what this is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's so true. I, I, and I do think deep down, deep down. Now deep, we're talking. Yeah, yeah, let's get deep. It's deep, be deep down. Five. Yeah, back, that's right. Because I want to go back, deep. Back to the boys' grade cricket days. I know none of them want anything to do with their grade cricket roots. <laughs> Some don't but have clubs, genuinely. Some don't have clubs, There's a story right. sitting there. Yeah, yeah, one, of, one of them genuinely some don't doesn't have, have a club but, and, but, it's, yeah. and it's a point of pride. Yeah, but uh, I think deep down there, there will be that fire burning going, no, there's no way these guys are better than us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But that, that that in itself But how do you is, harness the fire? Exactly, yeah. and that in itself is one of the traps that I think Andrew McDonald will be very wary of and he and Cummins will be um, imposing upon his players, impressing upon his players, I should say to not get sucked into their style of cricket because every other team that's come up against England in the last 12 months has tried to match mm. that style of cricket and it hasn't worked. They've they've fallen into the trap of playing the way England want them to play. Guys have gone out there and tried to score at the same rate, opposition teams, when they don't have the same capability. They're not the same style of player. Mm. So, yeah, Australia needs to remember that they have a particular brand that they want to play and they're – they may have to check their egos at the door, and that may be the way to win, which is, you know, it goes against everything they've ever so awesome. known over the last 20 years of playing cricket individually. But yeah, mm. it, it, it is going to be fascinating. Anything anything could happen. It, it could be five of the best, best matches we've ever seen. Yeah. Or not. Or one not. of those two things. <laughs> well, like, you know, day, day, you know Ed, Edge Baston, day one, England go at seven and a half and over, you know. 
it's Pakistan all over again. Like how soon before the old generation say you just got to bump them? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you just got to look upstairs. You just got to crank it up. Like <laughs> I, I just – that's why baseball is so awesome because it is going to like – Culture wars. It, oh, it's going to be culture mm. wars and it's going to like really stick in the craw of the Aussie ego, especially if like we're playing ego-free, like, you know, fully planned, meticulous cricket. Yeah. I don't know. I asked you before um, about an English opener, but obviously Australia's opener is under uh, threat for his position. There is there is no evidence of David Warner succeeding red ball cricket in uh, in the UK. There's not There's, no evidence. As he as he scored, so the 2015 tour he got a half century in every single test match. Okay, okay. Uh, my mistake. That wasn't the last tour, so that you know wasn't the last. That's tour. not the last I remember. In the last tour, he got a single figure score in every mm. single test match. Okay, and he scores some runs with Delhi, so that'll obviously transfer across. Um, so, like, but there's there's something in me which is like, ah, oh, I feel like he could figure it out, you know. I feel like he could, but he's in the he's in the squad for the first two, as the replacement. Harris is there as the backup batter, but Bancroft is also playing county cricket for Somerset, isn't he? He hasn't played the last couple. I'm not 100 percent sure on where Cameron is. Okay. Whether it was a short term deal with Somerset or so. Or you, so I mean, anyway. Marcus Harris then is the, is next cab. Well, he's in the squad, and they've yeah. they've declared their hand. They've said he is next cab, and uh, George Bailey and Andrew McDonald both said on record that. Despite the fact he didn't go to India, they don't see him as the next best option there and they actually use Travis Head to open the batting in those conditions yeah. for, for a variety of reasons. But away from the subcontinental conditions, they see Harris as the next opener by okay. quite some margin. Okay, because Renshaw's in and around as well, mm-hmm. but he's been batting as low as five for Queensland, hasn't he? Because, I mean, he, when he, he played for Australia, he opened the batting and filled it first slip. And then he went away. Then he played middle order for Queensland, but he's there as the backup batter as well. Yeah, he went back. He's been back to the top for Queensland for the last year and a half. Okay. He, there was a period there where he was batting. Five, okay, yeah. right. Okay, but he wouldn't be an option, you don't think, for opening the batting. He could be, but Harris is next cap. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, you just mentioned Delhi earlier. He goes and. Uh, for, for those who are listening or watching the show, uh, the reserve day of the IPL has really fucked with our recording, so we do not know <laughs> what happened in the IPL final. But uh, very important to just follow the form lines of the IPL and uh, how that will translate to, uh, you know, upcoming test matches. And, uh, you know, Cam Green has had a pretty good season with Mumbai first time around. Now, I'm asking you specifically, Alex, because – uh, famously, you know, you, you captained him at grade level and then uh, last time we asked you, you declined to discuss his um, tubbing habits and <laughs> possibly because he was underage, you know. <laughs> possibly. Uh, Definitely and, uh, because and, he was uh, underage. Yeah, and uh, just general morality um, being a, a reasonable, uh, dignified citizen. Um <laughs> But I, you, you, you will have, you will have watched the IPL. I'm off on a little tangent now. You will have watched the IPL on on paternity leave, no doubt. And I don't know about you, but like I just, I felt for the first time, I noticed a little bit of uh, like physical swagger accompanying his performances and yeah. his cricket until now for Australia, which has been very serviceable for a young guy as an all rounder, has probably been noteworthy for how demure and shy he seems for, for a guy so big and he is big so um did you notice that as well i guess is what i'm asking because i just thought it was this uh, i've never seen chest protrusion from cam green but i thought i saw it protrude uh for for mumbai it's there it's yeah. in there yeah because i want to ask like going back to grade like it, it, does in it there. exist yeah. in, in it's within in there. Him? yeah he's always been unsure of himself when he's made the jump up a level yeah which is probably a sign of like social maturity a little bit as Incredible well. Incredible sign of yeah. humility, and but he's 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 so talented that he's able to figure it out on the run in incredibly quickly, and then reach the level and go beyond level beyond the level even quicker. Uh, but once he gets to the level and he gets comfortable, then that that inner confidence is definitely there, and I could see it. Uh, you could definitely see it after the hundred. He's now got breakout hundreds at Test level, uh, at IPL level. He's got a test match fiver in, in under the belt now as well. So I think there will be some confidence that will start to exude from him. Uh, and and it's I don't know whether it's going to help him play any better than he already does, but it'll, it'll certainly provide some intimidation for opposition, knowing already what his raw physical and, and skill um, 
technical skill sets uh, can provide that he, he has an inner confidence as well that he's at the level or believes he's better than the level that that just brings a, a whole new element to him as a cricketer so it's, it's not easy though is it like you know he can have this breakout hundred playing in India as an all-rounder and then do it at the IPL taking a little while to warm up and then basically becoming the man you know as as Mumbai mm. uh, closed in on the playoffs made the playoffs were challenging for the final they, they, they put him in at three and four when previously been a little bit down the order so they wanted him to drive it and so there is there's this expectation of him as the as the man arriving as the future of cricket and I don't even know what we're meant to expect from him this time around because he could click the whole side together. But the the kids never played cricket in England once, right? Like in his life, has he had a oh, club believe, season there? No, he hasn't. I don't believe he's had a club season there. Right, I, I, so, he so, definitely you know, hasn't actually. It, and I don't know whether he's even played a tour, any kind of academy <laughs> tour game there. He'd, he'd actually done that in India. He'd gone yeah. to the MRF Academy in India at least once, if not twice. So yeah. he had some experience there, but I don't believe he's ever yeah. been to England. I suppose that's a future of cricket right there, but. Mm. You know, hundred or forty rocks in the IPL, red wasn't it? And uh, yeah, and then now you've got to go to England, son, and face the scarlet red ball. You know, um, possibly a second new ball uh, on on whatever the wickets might be. And yeah, we'll we'll need you to average around forty to forty five with the blade and and do a job. You know, with the ball as well. What where should our expectations be? Because it's such a specific place to try and execute and learn your skills, right? Uh, I- it's. I don't think people appreciate how difficult a challenge this is. Not. I don't think any Australians ever done this because I we I can't remember. We haven't had an Ashes series this early in the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So never has any. I mean, Warner's been there twenty thirteen, fifteen, nineteen. So he's probably the best example of. IPL into Ashes, but there mm. would have been a break in between because the Ashes have started at the back end of July, even the start of August. The yeah. last one in 29 was the start of August. Yeah. Uh, he had the World Cup in between. So there's that, there's a, a period of time where they can make the readjustments. He's got seven days going from playing in that playoff, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and when he walks out, I'm expecting him to yeah, be so piffing guys down excuses, the ground. And excuses, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, yeah, and he, he, got, that he, got, off, he got, off the, got off the plane, was expected to have 36 Sable foot points up in the, yeah. on the golf <laughs> tour first half. Yeah, and then, 36, did he? Oh, <laughs> oh really? I don't, oh, he's no. on form, he's hitting them well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Take it, a grain. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge ask for him. He, no, he, he, he is as capable, he's more capable of, of making the transition quicker than anybody else on the planet. But I, I think, People should temper their expectations, certainly in the WTC final in the first two test matches, because he has a history, as we've seen over the last 12... In his first couple of years of international cricket, he is a slow starter in series, mm. um, and it takes time. Remember, last summer he was in... He didn't play any cricket. He was in and around the World T20 squad. Oh, yeah. didn't play. He was carrying the drinks all through that tournament, yeah. which looks absurd now yeah. uh, and then played one game at the back of the tournament then played a couple of ODIs and then he hadn't had a red ball hit and he of course he was pretty scratchy in the first couple of test matches he had pad rash in Perth when Marnus made mm. 200 and 100 and and so it took him a while to get into the series and then he finally made 50 with a broken finger in in um, in Melbourne and didn't play for another month so uh, He's notoriously so starter, but the longer series have gone, every series that he's played, he's got better. The last Ashes series, he was very slow to get started. He, he had a couple of issues early on in Brisbane and Adelaide, got some runs in Sydney, played his best innings in Hobart, um, a little mm. bit the same. It, it took him a little while to get into the rhythm in indoor um, after missing the first two tests in India and then played a blinder in Ahmedabad. So mm. he'll, he'll get better the longer it goes, but I think he needs a bit of time to acclimatise and get himself yeah. back into red ball mode because he's been going very hard with the hands and Cam, when he plays his best in red ball cricket, um, softer hands, lower hands, a lower back lift um, and and he, he plays with control. Plays later as well. Mm. Yeah. Certainly does, yeah. Lots of chat about Nisa and him doing really well in the county championship, aka third grade. Um, <laughs> threes. At, threes, yeah. A straight to 5-0 all of a sudden again. Who's threes? Um, <laughs> where does Nisa live for you? And by that I mean, what's his exact home address? <laughs> no, like, where, do, where does he live for you? <laughs> where does he live for you? Because, because you know, like, <laughs> 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 sorry, sorry. Because he's like, you know, he's been in and around for a minute. 
And you know, he got uh, he got leapfrogged by Boland. He got leapfrogged by Jai Richardson. Um, I think he's for me. He's going to be just a terrific first class cricketer with like a and he, like he's he's a kind of guy who'll come in probably play probably play Test matches in the Ashes or if not the World Test Championship final. Um, and I think he like he won't let you down. You know, like he's just not a guy who's going to bowl like you know bad spells and and he's got potential for runs as well. Just think he's like. There's a reason he's been in the squad for four, five, six years and barely played because guys keep jumping in. There's a reason for that, right? And, like, I th- as I say, I think he's a guy who won't let you down, but I think people – I'm just giving my opinion – like, uh, that people need to call their jets on Nisa being, like, the, the difference to win the Ashes. Do you know what I mean? Like, where, where, do you, where do you sit with Nisa? I think he's an outstanding cricketer. Um, mm. He is a victim of the ball speed – mentality in Australia. Sure. I had a really interesting conversation uh, without trying to plug a piece that we did. We, I had an interview with Trent Copeland after he retired from first class cricket that we ran as a basically a Q and a on, on cricket info. And you can find it now if you, if anyone's interested in it. And, mm-hmm. and I posed those questions to Trent because he was a part of a group of cricketers during an era where, you know, he and Chad Sayers and Michael Neeson and to a lesser extent, Scott Boland, um, Jackson Bird, Jackson Bird's another who, outstanding first-class records, mm. dominant at Sheffield Shield level, um, but were never really considered to play regular test cricket for Australia because of this ball speed, air speed mentality whereby test matches are played on flatter surfaces and there is a view that you need extra ball speed, 141, 142, 145 plus, mm. to have an impact on those, on those pitches. Um, and... You know, Trent gave a really articulate and, and well thought out answer on that. And he says, if, if you deliver on any surface at any level, you should be considered to play at the next level. And I think Nisa fits that mould. Now, mm. if you actually break down Michael Nisa's first class record in Australia, the gap between his average and strike rate and record in Brisbane at the Gabba compared to everywhere else is quite sizable. Right, okay. He averages, I think. I want to say 21, but it might be 23 at the Gabba, mm. and it's 30 plus at, at other venues. Okay. Um, it might be 30. Um, and so he you may be. You want to be right because the NISA guys are going yeah. to have fucking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, sort of places like SCG, MC, old MCG bowled a lot at. Um, he hasn't got a great record there. Junction Oval's been a bit of a graveyard for every bowler, really. Yeah. Um, he's got a really good record in Perth, the Wacker, as a lot of guys do. Uh, so he may be a conditions-based guy and it may be unfortunate that, that he sort of lives on the fringe, but I see no reason why he can't play a huge part in this Ashes series. Yeah, okay. But I think they, again, a little bit like the Harris scenario, he is seen as the cab behind Boland, who is seen as the cab behind mm. Hazelwood. Hazelwood has a big question mark on him. Yeah, I was going to ask that next. Like, I mean, mm. for, they've included him in the World Test Championship squad. Is there a question about whether Boland will start before Hazelwood, you know, whether Boland has leapfrogged him? Uh, I, th- I think if Josh is fit, then they will play him. But he's not fit and, and he hasn't proven it. So Hazelwood hasn't have, – how, ga- how many games do you reckon he's played since November of last year in total? Cricket games, Josh Hazelwood. Oh, pro- probably one hand. I think he played three in the IPL. Correct. Uh, did he play one test match? Two. So, so, yeah, you're right. Five. five. He's played five cricket matches since November. Wow. Uh, he's played four test matches, four first-class games in two years. The last time he played back-to-back first-class games was the Border Gavaskar Trophy of 2021. Wow. So, he's done his side twice, and then he's had the Achilles tendonitis problem that kept him out of the um, Porto Gavaskar Trophy in India just recently and in the one day series and delayed his arrival into India for the IPL mm-hmm. and now he's got uh, the scan showed up clear apparently according to the um, Cricket Australia medical team uh, and but a little bit of side soreness that they don't say is related to his previous injuries but I mean he's had two side injuries so it's clearly related in some way shape or form yeah. uh, and they've got six test matches in, in seven weeks and there, there's a question mark over whether he can play two in a row, let alone six in seven weeks yeah. or even play one. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Scott Boland's got a, a, an incredible record of just backing up and he's super consistent and they know if, if they need it, he, he can bowl 50 overs two weeks in a row uh, and his record's sensational. But he too hasn't played any first-class cricket in England. So 
whereas Hazelwood's got a very good record in England. So, they're, yeah, they're, they're the conversations they'll be having. They'll know Hazelwood would be asked to do quite a heavy workload, I would say, in the uh, training camp that's in Beckenham just outside London later this week. They train Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then they'll have a day off on Sunday. He'll then have a really solid bowl, I would say, on the Monday, two days out from the World Test Championship final. If he, if he doesn't pull up or come up from any of those, bowling will play. Yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly. a squad game, really. I think. Yeah. I think they, you know, that whoever's playing the last test will be in completely different mm. lineup to the first test. Yeah. They have a theory, though, and it kind of fits in with uh, the way England have been playing over the last twelve months. That because England scores so quickly, and they're not worried about trying to bat time or or bury opposition in terms of just stacking overs on their opposition bowlers that they might not need to go that deep because England might make 350 but they might only bat for 65 overs mm. rather than in India where or in Pakistan where if someone piled up 400, 500, it mm. took 160 odd overs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah. England's own bowlers will be upset at their batters scoring too quickly <laughs> so not allow them to have a, have a break. Go sevens all you want but can I just put my feet up? <laughs> Well, it happened in the last uh, test England played, didn't it? I mean, they, yeah. they they were successful. They scored so quickly early in the game, bowled New Zealand out, and they were so so good with the ball first up, and they were so tempted to play golf on the fifth day that <laughs> <laughs> you know, they decided I think to we're enforce zeroing the in on the main thing. <laughs> uh, they decided yeah. to enforce a follow on and, uh, and and paid a price. But ultimately, you know, it was one of the great test matches of all time. So you can't really Six argue over. with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, with uh, England, Alex, uh, like where do you think Australia can put pressure on England? I know we just went through the England side in the eyes of a 90s um, mm. child, but uh, I, I noticed Ram Prakash did a piece saying if Crawley fails against Ireland, uh, pack him. He, he, he should be out. Uh, but do you see, apart from Zach Crawley, which is the big question in England about, you know, a guy being given unfavourable uh, opportunity compared to others. Do you see any other, uh, you know, weaknesses to exploit or just even anything within the England side that, that's worth noting? Well, I think the top order's got, got some questions on it. Mm. Absolutely. I think you know, Duckett hasn't – he's played very well, but he's played very well in excellent batting conditions in Pakistan and New Zealand. Um, those those wickets were really good, uh, and then he hasn't had a look at Test cricket in England, and hasn't mm. faced the Aussie attack. Uh, so he and then obviously Crawley and Pope's had his challenges against Australia, and so has Root in the last two series that they they played. So Australia will really want to make inroads in that top four, and then put pressure on the, the middle order who like to use the platform to then kick on and and really bury opponents. The other thing which is interesting, and we've discussed it already or sort of touched on it, is I think as quickly as England like to put runs on the board and and move the game along, I think Australia, if they get the right conditions with the bat, they could put time in the legs of the 41-year-old and Anderson and the 36-year-old Stuart Broad. They did it in Adelaide. Uh, in 2021, mm. remember? They, they mm. won the toss, oh. batted, and batted for 150 overs. Mm. It buried those guys. Stokes almost broke down mm. after that. He had to bowl those stupid, <coughs> that bouncer spell to mm. to see if they could make That's some right. inroads. If if they get the right conditions, I don't know whether they get them at Edge, but still not Lords, uh, potentially they could. Who knows? If they get the right conditions, the right side of conditions, let's say, let's say they win the toss, bowl first, or... You know, bowl first in some way, shape, or form. Bowl well, and then the wicket flattens out. They get some blue skies, and if they could bat for 130 overs plus uh, at, at a place like Lords, or where, where that can happen in the second innings of a match, they can really set the rest of the series up if they put that time in the legs of Anderson and Broad. Yeah, that that I would, I would, I don't know this for a fact, but I would think that would be an area where they would be thinking, particularly guys like Kawaja. Labashain and Smith would be thinking that's that's our chance to really make our stamp on the series is to make them really work for a long period of time and see if that uh, effort can stack up and then have a cumulative effect across the next three test matches and put us in the advantage. That that would to me that if I'm in that dressing room and doing that kind of planning, I'd be thinking that way. 
It's, it is funny, like, just when we're, when we're talking about this, then there's so many reasons to be optimistic if you're Australian, right? I mean, you look at the Australian side, <clears throat> all the batters average more than 45. Kawaj is a different player to when he was when he's played in England before. Travis Head the same. There's just, like... But there's still things of like, well, Travis Head's never done it in England, nor has Usman. Dave Warner had struggles last time. Marnus has never really done well away from home. Steve Smith can't do what he did again last time. He just can't. Um, Cam Green uh, is Cam Green, but he he gels the side together, sure, but he's he's never played a game of cricket there. Uh, Carey's done okay, but again, it's just it's fucking hard to win away from home, and it's hard to win in England. There's a reason why we haven't done it in 22 years. Um, but... But I'm still Australian nineties, like nah, yeah, but well, we'll figure it out. You know, like I mean, I mean, as we're talking here, we always give them a game. You know, we're talking, we're talking about batting for 130 overs here, right? And it's like, I, know, I completely understand. I think it's a really, it's a really good thing to be, to be targeting, especially at Lords where it can flatten out, right? But it's like, what happens if it all just falls over as well in Australia? You know, but this this is the interesting thing about the series where Australia's playing for greatness, but England's had this fucking rise up, and they're, I think they're third in the ICC uh, rankings because uh, that's obviously something we wake up to every morning and check. But um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I still thought, yeah, because yeah, the IPL's we been up for three think, months. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's Nisa's address? <laughs> <laughs> and what's my phone? Hey, number? babe, Nisa. <laughs> See what's what's the Addy? <laughs> um, so that, that's 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 the interesting thing. You like, but. Can you can you see it falling over for Australia? Can you see it ending careers? Can Steve Smith finish his career or Dave Warner never play again? Can can you see, can you see that happening? Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what yeah. can you see? Name well, things you can see. Yeah. <laughs> you literally said we don't know what will happen, but uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a world in which our openers can have another horror show, right? For sure. Yeah, no doubt. Because it wasn't said, said right. It's he, the hardest he, place to that. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. He he's already laid the foundation. I had yeah. a look at some numbers. What did Usman say? Like just uh, hardest place in the world to bat yeah. if, you're in, if you're opening in three. Yeah, that's what you would say before you score a bunch of runs, though, wouldn't you? Well, I, I, I look <laughs> since David Warner's made his test debut, of the guys who've had ten innings or more as an opening batter in England, there's only two blokes that have averaged more than forty, and no one's averaged more than fifty. Wow, it's Cook, Cook and Chris Rogers. Yeah. yeah, everybody right. else is under forty, and then there's a whole stack of them under thirty, including Dave. And Dave's not the worst by any stretch. He's yeah. got guys like Tom Latham, who's a really good, mm. world class Test opener behind mm. him. Shikhar Darwin, um, Zach Crawley, Alex Lees. Mm. So it's a brutally hard place to open the batting, mm. it, and it's actually dumb to do it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah why would you do it? it shows how he good says Cook was. As a former opening bat. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it does show you, and it it shows you how good Alistair Cook was. I think truly underappreciated as one of the all time yeah. great openers. It yeah. also shows you how good Chris Rogers was. To yeah. be honest, in yeah. in two tours to do what he did. Mm. Uh, so that would be an area where England be. I mean, Stuart Broad's already. Talking about it, he'd, he'd be licking his chops at coming yeah. around the wicket to both left-handers. Um, heck, we even saw it in Nagpur. They'd done all this work in Bangalore about facing spin and how they were going to deal with it. And opening morning in the first six overs, Siraj and Shami go bang, bang yeah. against Warner and Kawaja yeah. and the game's opened up. Yeah. So, you know, that that's certainly an area where Australia will be vulnerable. And then, uh, obviously... You'd expect Labuschagne and Smith to bat well, and I think they'd both be really annoyed about India. None of us would have thought it going to India it, for that series that they'd score one half century between them. Mm. Mm. And you wouldn't even think that Australia would get close to winning the series with yeah. Smith not getting a half right, century right, right, and yeah. Marnus getting a you know basically a cheap one in the in the last game on a yeah. flatty. Yeah. So that'd be the area they'd be looking at, and then you know Australia's. Tail has not batted well. No. That's a big area of concern for Australia. I think that's something they are definitely working on, and that'll be an interesting part of the series is which tail bats better. Mm. Uh, that, that, that's that, a big plus for Nisa as well. I, I would yeah. say so, absolutely. Yeah. You know, he, if he comes in and bats at eight, um, you know, if you've got – yeah, it's a hard one because he – I don't know whether he would play – He'll play if there's injuries, right? Yeah, I don't know whether he would play in front of Bowling. He'd probably likely play with Bowling, if that right. makes sense. So he would play in place of a Stark or a, right. heaven forbid, Cummins falls over. But, yeah. um, you know, but if if, if Bowling didn't play for whatever reason, then, you know, if you had Cummins, Nisa and Stark at 8, 9, 10, suddenly you've got a bit of depth there. Because mm. um, Stark's a 
very good player um, and has played well, I think, in the past in England. So, yeah, that, I think that'll be – there's two areas. And the other one is the wicketkeeper. I mean, Alex Kerry's um, played really well at test level. He, I don't know that you can take much out of the India series given the surfaces that they played on. Uh, he made 100, obviously, in his last innings away from India, which was at the MCG. But he's he's, he's played first-class cricket in England, actually. I think he's got a first-class 100 at okay. Sussex. Uh, but he hasn't played test cricket in England, so that would yeah. be a big test for him as well. And I think deep down he'd probably want some runs in that seven slot. But he's such an unselfish guy that he doesn't really – it doesn't. it's not something that, it, that, that drives him or that burns away at him. But in terms of how Australia's – going to win the series he will be pretty pivotal particularly him and green if they can combine if australia's top orders wobbled at all those guys are going to be really important mm, mm, mm. oh some just unbelievable x's and o's uh today <laughs> talking cricket i love the th- I, I do like x's and o's with you alex i do i do like yeah, it's too much nuffy stuff though no it's not, it's not <laughs> it's not it's not not at all well I, I gave you the opportunity to talk about cam green in the showers you declined yeah that's true you know <laughs> 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 and rightfully so. Uh, if you ever get Greeny on, you'll have to ask him yourself. <laughs> yeah, a lot of early words in that sentence doing heavy lifting. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, no, we, we we appreciate we appreciate the analysis, man. Uh, and uh, everyone can catch Alex Malcolm's work on ESPN Crick Info, uh, mate. We hope to see you back here in the studio and uh, welcome back from paternity leave, where you um you learn that works way easier than um parenting. <laughs> No doubt about that. Thank you very much for Alex, to Alex, for coming in uh, and spending time with us uh, here in our blessed studio, which has not been blessed in any way just yet. Where do you get holy water from, Pez? Uh, yeah, I guess, like, I mean, I would get it from a church, but I don't know where they get where it they from. Get it I don't from? know who their suppliers are. Costco? Yeah. I'd be curious to know. The you must su- be able to get bulk holy the, water. The supply chain of holy water. Yeah. When does, like, rain... Yeah. Become holy water. Right. Yeah. Very interesting question. Again, let us know. Uh, hashtag AskTGC. Do you want to read this? Yes. Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Uh, interesting. Josh Wilmot uh, writes in, and has he said later on that he wants it to be anonymous? I don't think so. Uh, no, he signs off with much <coughs> love, Josh. Gents, uh, said as you might say, boys, but with some English respectability, please. Gents. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. It's a Thursday evening and my wife is away, so I'm sitting in my garden with a glass of wine, some snacks, and leafing through the latest Wisden Almanac that my father-in-law gave me. Yes, I have a garden. Yes, I drink wine. Yes, my snacks is just a bowl of fucking crisps. And no, I'm not a nonce because I occasionally thumb the almanac. (laughs) (laughs) And lo and behold, page 160 fucking five podcasts in 2022 the first two paragraphs ahead of tailenders the final word and wisdom's very own wisdom cricket podcast is dedicated to two coats from the internet you might not have read it maybe you have either way let me another random fucking coat from the internet comment on said paragraphs one they say you quote remained the funniest show congrats stiff fucking competition there lads two a direct quote of the first few lines Look out, said Sam Perry. We have not yet felt the impact of this deal. It was June, just after the IPL had secured its multi-million TV contract. The great cricketer remained the funniest show, and as ever, there was a smile in Perry's voice as he delivered the news. But there was a tremor, too. Close quote. Of course there was a tremor. Good luck in the ashes, soft cock. (laughs) Three. Next paragraph refers to the sadness of the clowns. Bit disrespectful if you ask me. Anyway, no real questions. Compelled to write in largely through boredom. So while I have you, a couple of questions. What's your favourite flavour of crisp? Is Ollie Robinson equipped to take over the banter merchant title from Stuart Broad? Why do I feel compelled to ask my wife, who's a fan of the show, but asks if I'm listening to Pezzy Lad again, sorry, here goes, <laughs> if she can wear an Ian Bell mask in bed while I try and execute the perfect cover drive? Much love, Josh. Salt and vinegar for me. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm big on a salt and vinegar. You see, mate, it, that's interesting to me because I, I believe – I feel salt and vinegar is quite beloved by a lot of people. Yeah. Now, I have a personal issue with salt and vinegar that I think is more, uh, you know, Freudian in nature. So I, I have a sister who's five years older than me and she was sick and probably still remains sick 
for salt and vinegar chips or crisps, depending on where you are. Okay. And would just, you know, without fail, opt for salt and vinegar at all costs and times. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point as I was, you know, developing, I wanted to distance my identity from my sister. And uh, so I had – I and perhaps – Maybe I didn't want to distance my identity from my sister and I was just physically beaten by her uh, into not touching her chips. Yeah. Uh, so for that reason, I've always had like a like a, a distance from salt and vinegar. I don't even think I'm able to appreciate the taste of it for what it is. Interesting. Uh, is it? It is it because <laughs> I'm not sure it is. But um, <laughs> No, but sorry. I was thinking I, about something else in my head and yeah, I was like, then no, I started talking to myself. Me too, mate. Me too. Uh, <laughs> That's interesting, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, did I just say that? What Am I my thoughts? So – I know that salt and vinegar tastes good, but I have this like a uh, reflexive, um, like keenness not to allot it my favorite crisp. Sure, you sure, know? yeah, yeah. But yeah. The th- here's and here's the other thing. Go on. So as a child, my favorite crisp flavor was chicken, and I know that that's some basic shit now. Okay, you know, and I, I you know, shamefully, I'm concerned about whether. What that says about me, mm-hmm. like chicken, mm-hmm. you, 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 did you grow up in a fucking trailer park? You know, that kind of gear, which is wrong. Everything about it is wrong, prejudiced, classist, etc. but it's the truth. Yep. I love chicken chips. Okay? Chicken chips. not And, and that's chicken-flavoured chips, yeah. crisps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean chicken salt on a hot chip. Now, that's a separate conversation. So my favourite chip as a child, was chicken. Though I don't think I'd say that if I was in a shop now choosing crisps yeah. and I'm willing to change between crisp and chip, as is my want, I don't think I would choose chicken chips. <laughs> I had a stroke <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> this is the most animated you've been the entire show. <laughs> I, I, um, I first came across the salt and vinegar crisp. Mm. When I was swimming as a child. Oh, and you've got an association. Yep. Yeah. Because I got a yes. little fucking treat. Yeah. From Papa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, who I now, in my head, is Logan Roy. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the end of swimming, if I had b- done well at training, fucking sliding straight into a bag. Now. Of something. Now, now let's, uh, of course, <laughs> I hope so. Um, and that's when I, that's when I started to associate. So you know, when you walk into like a chlorine pool, and it just fucking hits you in the face. Oh yeah, like that for me transports me to like 1993 and beyond. Yes, uh, when I was like, yeah, training heaps. I mean, I, yeah. no, no, no. I'll, I'll I'll step in here for you here. For, if you're new to the show, he goes was a very uh, successful junior swimmer, swam at nationals. Um, you know, have a look at the Jimmy Jack on him uh, and the Rocky Boulders there. And so what I want to ask about Ian is. Mm. You said you got the crisp if you'd done well at training. Now, who's a judging whether you'd done well or not? Is it a coach? Is it papa in the stands? Mm-hmm. And what does it mean to do well at junior swimming training? You, um, got, you got your turns right. You knocked over, you know, Ryan, who lived next door. Fuck, Ryan was good. Well, what is it? It was more just behavioural, I think, you know. Pavlov's dogs. <sighs> You get. If he you, was a great if you, guy. If you, if you, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He, he was good in the butterfly. Four by two. <laughs> he could finish it, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, you you've swum well. You've swum well, Missy. Here's a chip. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so then I so then I associate chlorine with. Like it takes me like takes me to both places. Like if I have salt and vinegar chips, I can taste chlorine as well, and vice versa. And if I go near like an indoor pool, I can smell chlorine. It takes me to salt and vinegar chips. Yeah, and that's where I also struggle with heroin addiction. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. Not sure how just yet, but so. And do you, have, has your love of salt and vinegar chips remained like into yeah, adulthood yeah, as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like a kind of a nostalgic thing. I'm, I'm salivating just thinking about salt and vinegar chips now. Yeah. Right. Mm. It's a good it, look. It's a good chip, isn't it? Like it's good for a child, and it's also. I'm not saying like you know. There's a lot of gourmet chips knocking around now, which yeah. is a disgrace, frankly. Mm. You know, like uh, the the gentrification <laughs> of a crisp. It's a disgrace. But I would venture, mm. maybe not to some of the patrician, you know, posh types listening to the show, that yeah. a, a salt and vinegar crisp still is still passable. It's not a reasonable taste to offer an adult. I'm not saying I'm bringing a bag of fucking salt and vinegar Smiths. You know, to a party. Yep. 
but uh, it, it's still a. If it, you brought that, you'd be welcome inside my home. Thank you. You'd be welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Well, and that's the answer to that review in wisdom. <laughs> thanks to Budgie Smuggler. Thanks very much to Alex Malcolm for coming in. See you guys in Sydney tomorrow night for the first of the live show tour for 2023. Looking forward to that, seeing you guys there. And we'll see you guys on the internet with hopefully some more cricket news next week. See you later.